Remember where you need to be on April 14th, in the streets, shutting it down, and bring a lot of other people with you. Now look, we're one week out from April 14th, a week out from a day when we must disrupt business as usual in this country because that business as usual includes police getting away with murdering black and Latino people. We have to manifest powerful resistance all across the country, bringing the normal routine of this society to a halt. This resistance has to make clear that there's a force of people in this society who are determined to act to stop the systemic problem of the authorities giving a green light to police who brutalize and murder people. Now, I didn't come here tonight to tell you that it would be easy to do that. And if I did tell you that, I'd be lying. What I did come here to do, though, was to lay out how deep this problem runs in this society and just what we're up against in acting to stop it. I came to tell you why we have to act on April 14th and how that can be part of bringing a whole new world into being. I'm also gonna get into how we can do that. And I came to recruit you, to recruit you to do something that really matters. And what that comes down to is doing something that will contribute to stopping police murder. Not slowing it down, not lessening it, but stopping it, because that's what's needed. Now you all saw some of the parents up here just now. I wanna take us a little bit more into the reality that calls on us to stop it. Let's talk about Brother Jason Harrison from Dallas, a young black man was living with his mother. Brother was mentally challenged. He was having a mental episode. His mother calls 911 to get some help. What she got was several cops came to the door. She went to answer the door and her son, Jason, comes behind her. And he had a screwdriver in his hand, a screwdriver. When the cops saw the screwdriver, and these cops had their bulletproof vests on and all of that. They pull their guns out. They point them at Jason. And then they start yelling at him. Put down the screwdriver. Put down the screwdriver. Put down the screwdriver. And the Jason doesn't do anything. He just stands there holding the screwdriver. And then they open fire on him. Shoot him down right in his mother's front door. Jason falls over with his arms under him. You can hear the mother in the background. You killed my son. You killed my son. And these cops point their guns at Jason's prone body and continue to yell at him. Drop the screwdriver. Drop the screwdriver. Let's also talk about Philip White, 22-year-old black man, Vineland, New Jersey. About a week or so ago, cops came to his door and arrested him. We still don't know what they arrested him for, but they arrested him, put him into handcuffs and took him out of his apartment. And then after they got him out, they threw him on the ground. And then they began to savagely brutalize him. They beat Philip. They kicked Philip. They stomped Philip. Then one of the pigs went to the car, the police car, and got a police dog and sick the dog on, Jason, on Philip. The dog bit Jason, Philip in the face and along his body. 10 hours later, Philip White was dead. Now these are just two of the many, many people killed by police in this country. In just the first 85 days of this year, 78 unarmed people were killed by the police. And that's just the unarmed people. If we look at the month of March, police in this country killed 115 people. 
And that's just in March alone. This poster makes real and concrete how widespread this problem is. And we need to make use of this poster everywhere we can in the days leading up to April 14 to enlist people in joining in with us in disrupting business as usual. And we need to use it on April 14th to make people confront the reality that we're dealing with and to challenge them that they got to get out there and join us in doing something about it. And to give people who are in the streets a sense that we are right when we go out to set, stop business as usual. Now look, it's bad enough that the police kill the people that they're supposed to protect and serve. On top of that, the whole system goes into motion to get the killer cops off when they do kill people. Their fellow cops maintain a blue wall of silence or they tell lies to try to cover up these murderous deeds that these cops have done. The district attorneys quickly pronounce these killings as justifiable homicide or they convene a grand jury and lead it to conclude that these killer cops committed no crimes. Now in the very few cases, and it's really very few, where a cop gets charged for killing people, the charges never match up to what they actually did. And, and in these cases where they get charged, the DAs just forget how to prosecute and the killer cops get off. But see, let's not leave out the media either because they get in on this. They take the police story and put it out there like it's the absolute truth including when the cops kill somebody, if they can find even a hint of a criminal record, then that gets put out in the media. Even when the person was doing absolutely nothing wrong when the cops killed them, they still want to get that hint out there that, oh, well, this must have been a criminal. See, that's bad, that's horrible, but it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop with the killings and the killer cops getting off. The cops and the whole criminal injustice system in this country mistreats and abuses the loved ones of those they kill. Look, and I don't have time to get into all of the details because I could tell you a whole lot about this, but let me just touch on a few things. When the cops killed Ramarley Graham up in the Bronx in his mother's house in front of his grandmother and his younger brother, after they killed him, they took his grandmother into custody, took her down to the police station, and interrogated the sister for hours. Her lawyer came down, demanded to see his client. They refused to let him go in until they were finished interrogating her and finally realized they wasn't gonna get no, nothing out of her to try to justify what they had done. That was horrible. In Detroit a few years ago, police murdered seven-year-old Ayanna Stanley Jones. They threw a grenade into the house. They broke into the wrong house to start with, threw a grenade in, and then a cop fired a bullet, shot her through the head. After they killed this little girl, they arrested her grandmother and tried to blame her for the little girl's death. Juanita knows this because she went up there with me to Detroit right after this happened because we had to be up there with those people. Now look, I know a lot of y'all saw the video of the cops in Cleveland who murdered 12-year-old Tamir Rice. Well, there was a longer video. And in that longer video, after they murder him, you see a young woman rush out. That's Tamir's sister, running to try to comfort her brother. The cops tackle her to the ground take her into custody and put her in the back of the police car, leaving Tamir there bleeding out, dying on the ground. And then later, Tamir's mother comes, wanting to comfort her son, afraid that he was dying. They threatened to arrest his mother, and made her get out of there, and would not let her go to see her dying son. Think about the inhumanity of a system whose enforcers do things like this 
again and again and again. And look, the way the police get away with murdering black and Latino people, that's bad in its own right. But it's also a concentration of an overall program of suppression that has a genocidal thrust. It's the way this system holds down black and Latino people today. And it's a continuation of the savage oppression that this system has enforced on black people since the very first Africans were dragged to these shores in slave chains. This is the ugly truth of what goes down in this country. Now usually people just suffer the murder and the brutality that the police inflict. Too many people accept the lies that the people who were killed by the police deserve what they got. Other people get the message that there's nothing that we can do about it, that the system is too powerful, so we might as well just shut up and accept it. But when Darren Wilson murdered Michael Brown in Ferguson, society was forced to confront the truth. And they were forced to confront the truth because people in Ferguson stood up, took to the streets, and stayed in the streets. I mean, the authorities threw everything that they could at those defiant young people. Tear gas, rubber bullets, sound cannons. They put a curfew down. They mobilized the National Guard. But still those people stayed in the streets. The power of their resistance reached out to me and compelled me to go down to Ferguson to be with them a few days after Michael Brown was murdered. Actually, Juanita went down there with me too then. It seemed like we run around together a little bit. See, now these days, you hear these talking heads in the media saying, well, you know, the protests in Ferguson, they were marred by violence. Well, look, I was down there, and I'll tell you what I saw. I saw defiant young people who refused to suffer this brutality and murder any longer in silence. I saw young black men in street organizations who a week before had been fighting and killing each other who got out of that and were standing together to demand justice for Michael Brown and to fight against police brutality and police murder. And I met people who welcomed me and other people who came down to Ferguson to be on the front lines of this fight with them. It, it, give it up, give it up, it deserves it. No, because the power of what people did in Ferguson reached out to the whole country and inspired others to act. And then this got taken to an even higher level when the grand juries refused to indict the cops who murdered Eric Garner and Michael Brown. People poured into the streets all across the country, blocking highways, blocking bridges, blocking tunnels. Several thousand folks up in Minnesota went into the Mall of the Americas. It's supposed to be the biggest mall in the country. Well, that day, it was the most shut down mall in the country, because folks was like, this is all that's happening here. Black Lives Matter is what's happening here. All of that happened and more, and look, that's just some ideas on what might need to happen on the 14th. See, look, it was inspiring to see these people from different backgrounds standing together in this. To see black people, white people, Latinos, Asians out in the streets together saying black lives matter. This showed people This showed people who've been messed over by this system forever that if they stood up, others could be one to join them in resistance. It gave people a beginning sense that the system didn't have it as together as they want us to think. That maybe we could do something about the attacks that they bring down on us. 
that maybe we didn't have to live this way. And look, right in the middle of all this was the historic dialogue that Bob Avakian, the leader of the Revolutionary Communist Party, and my dear brother Cornell engaged in. The theme of this dialogue was revolution and religion, the fight for emancipation and the role of religion. And it gave people a deeper sense of how a different way for people to live could be brought into being. And look, people can check this dialogue out, right? Well, don't, don't do it right now. After the thing is over, you can go up on the website, revcom.us, because we put that dialogue and a film of it up online. Now, all of this, the powerful resistance and the swirl of revolutionary ideas, it was like a door got cracked open and people could see a glimmer of hope that things could be different. Well, the system came back at this. They came back with arrests. They came back with heavy charges. And they came back with lie on top of lie. I want to take one lie, one big lie that they told. And that's the lie that Michael Brown caused his own death. That it was his fault that he got murdered. See, now this is a lie that Darren Wilson, the murdering pig who killed Michael Brown, He's the one who told this lie, but the whole system has embraced it and is pushing it in our faces. You damn right it is. I mean, look. They tell us, they tell us that Michael Brown didn't have his hands up. They tell us that he attacked Wilson and that Wilson had no choice but to kill him in self-defense. Now when they tell us this, they're trying to give us a bigger message. And that message is that this whole movement of resistance to police getting away with murder is based on a lie. Well, that's not true, sisters and brothers. Mike Brown was just walking down the street when Wilson accosted him. Wilson pulled his gun out. Mike Brown ran to get away then he turned around and yes, he put his hands up and Wilson gunned him down. Now some people will say, now wait a minute, Carl, you wasn't there, how do you know he had his hands up? I know he had his hands up because I saw right after they killed him, there was a whole bunch of people there who saw it and they said, the brother had his hands up when he got shot. There was even two white guys who were just happened to be working in the neighborhood. And there's a video of them watching it. And then they go, oh, he had his hands up when the cop shot him. All of those folks said that. Now the district attorney, he said it don't happen that way. He said the witnesses who said Michael Brown had his hands up were not credible. But see, this is a district attorney who put on an eyewitness to back up Darren Wilson's story, who wasn't even there. That was the witness. He felt that was credible evidence from somebody who wasn't even there. But all of those folk who were there, they weren't credible because they weren't saying what he wanted them to say. See, now, Eric Holder and the Department of Justice embraced this whole lie and tried to shove it down our throats. Now see, this is important because Holder came down to Ferguson actually shortly after I did, like he was going to be some kind of savior. He had people thinking that, look, if the locals don't give you justice, come see me. You can count on me. See, now this is a part of another lie they want us to believe, they want us to swallow, that we can rely on the people in power, that some of them are our friends. This is a big part of how they keep us under control. The truth is the whole damn system is committed to unleashing the police. When they swagger through our neighborhoods like an occupying army, the whole system is behind them. And the whole system backs them up when they brutalize and kill people. The system pushes these lies to confuse us about who's right and who's wrong. 
What they're trying to do is they're trying to slam shut that door that got cracked open. They're trying to double lock it. They want to close it so tight that we could never rise up again. And we cannot let that happen, sisters and brothers. On April 14th, we got to revive the spirit of Ferguson, that spirit of refusing to suffer the brutality and murder of the system in silence. We got to revive it and we got to take it higher. We have to get back out in the streets and we got to declare that we're not backing down and that we are not going away. We have to say that we're determined to fight this on April 14th and then Coming after April 14th, we got to continue building wave upon wave of resistance even more powerfully until we can stop murder by the police. We need to push the truth back out there and putting our, we got to put ourselves on the line as we do it. We can use these posters in doing that, taking them into the streets out on the campus if we're in school, into your neighborhoods. We need to use them to polarize the situation, forcing people to look squarely at the reality and challenging them to join us in doing something about it. Now this is a pretty big poster, but we need to make even bigger enlargements of this poster, huge enlargements, maybe something like 30 feet, and then carry them into the streets on April 14th like their floats, you know. They need to be, they need to be so big that by themselves they will capture the attention of people and break things out of the normal routine of society, whether we've got a thousand people carrying it or ten people carrying it. These posters powerfully represent the hundreds of people the police kill every year. When we take them into the streets, we are carrying the justification for what we're doing, the thing that indicates that we're right to do it. We're putting the horror of police murder out there for everybody to see. And we can't back down when we do this. If the authorities come to us and say, oh, well, you have to get onto the sidewalk, we have to say, no, this needs to be out in the streets. This needs to be where everybody can see it. Okay, and then leading up to April 14th, and this next week, these posters have got to be everywhere. You know, they should be big. They don't need to be as big as the 30-foot one that I'm talking about, but they should be big enough to attract attention. When you do that, because I just came back from L.A., we were at UCLA, we were at UC Riverside on uh, Stolen Lives Days, riveted people's attention. People wanted copies of the poster. They wanted to take pictures of themselves in front of it and to tweet it and put it on social media. We need to be doing this for this next week and we need to be recruiting the people whose attention is riveted by this poster to act with us on April 14th to stop this, these horrors. People need to go to the website of the network, the Stop Mass Incarceration Network that Cornell and I co-founded. That's stopmassincarceration.net. And we need to be working to drive people to that website. And we also should be working to drive people to the website of the Revolutionary Communist Party, revcom.us. Everybody needs to be going to these sites, finding out what's going on, getting a fuller perspective of what's behind what's happening, and getting organized and organizing others. People need to send in photos, reports, stories and vines to these sites and we'll post them up so that people can get a sense of a growing nationwide movement of resistance. In this way, we'll be making a huge move against police getting away with murder and against mass incarceration and also a move towards the transformation of all of society. We can do this, sisters and brothers. A whole lot of people want to see something done to stop the way the system gives a green light to killer cops. It's right beneath the surface, and then sometimes it bubbles over, comes out in the open for people to see. 
You saw it in Madison, Wisconsin. I actually saw it personally, but you could see it in the videos up on the Stop Mass Incarceration Network site when hundreds of high school students took to the streets last month after police in Madison, Wisconsin killed a young black man named uh, Tony Robinson. You can see it, you saw it on April 1st when people in the San Francisco area took over an immigration office. You saw it when people in Philadelphia turned out a town hall meeting where the police chief was trying to convince them that they should not look at his cops like they were an occupying army. And you see it in the response of students at college campuses like Duke and Oklahoma where racist outrages have gone down. Now look, I want to just say something serious to everybody here tonight and everybody who's watching on the live stream. It's good that you're doing that. You're showing something. You're showing a certain understanding of things. But I have to tell you, it's not enough to feel like something should be done about it, but not to act to do it. It's not good enough to hope that someone else will do it. You've got enough awareness of what needs to be done, or you wouldn't be here if you weren't aware of the problems. History is calling on us to act. This poster, the faces on this poster, are calling on you to act. Don't let this keep going on. Don't let there be new faces to add to this poster. We have to end a situation where teenagers come up to Noche and talk about how they figure they'll be on this poster sometime soon. We have to stop this. We have to act, and you have to be a part of it. When we act on April the 14th, we will be acting for and speaking to the people who want to see this horror stopped. And leading up to April 14th, we can tap into the people who have that sentiment and enlist them to join us in the streets on the 14th. Because look, sisters and brothers, it is illegitimate and unacceptable for this system to give a green light to its brutal murdering police. It's got to stop. And all these other horrors that this system visits on millions of people around the planet also have to stop. The wars for empire, the drone missile strikes, the horrible oppression that comes down on the sisters in this country. Also, what's done to lesbian, gay, and transgender people. Okay. And also, what they do to the immigrants and what they are doing to the environment of the whole planet we live on. All of this can be stopped. We do not have to live like this. And when we stand up, it lets us begin to see the truth of that. And it builds up our strength and our organization and understanding, and it gets us ready for the day when we could end all of this stuff, for real and for good. All these horrors can be stopped, and it will take a revolution to do it. I just want to talk about one example of what we could do through revolution. Bob Avakian, the leader of the Revolutionary Communist Party, who I told you about a little bit earlier, spoke to this in basics, commenting on the 1998 police killing of Taisha Miller, a 19-year-old black woman in Riverside, California, who was like unconscious in a car. Her family called the police. She had had a seizure. The cops came and they fired 23 shots into the car, hitting Taisha 12 times and killing her. This is what Bob Avakian had to say about this. If you can't handle this situation differently than this, then get the F out of the way. 
not only out of the way of this situation, but get off the earth. Get out of the way of the masses of people, because you know we could have handled this situation any number of ways that would have resulted in a much better outcome. And frankly, if we had state power and we were faced with a similar situation, we would sooner have one of our own people's police killed than wantonly murder one of the masses. That's what you're supposed to do if you're actually trying to be a servant of the people. You go there and you put your own life on the line rather than just wantonly murder one of the people. <laughs> F all this serve and protect BS. If they were there to serve and protect, they would have found any way but the way they did it to handle this scene. They could have and would have found a solution that was much better than that. This is the way the proletariat, when it's been in power, has handled and would again handle this kind of thing, valuing the lives of the masses of people, as opposed to the bourgeoisie in power, where the role of their police is to terrorize the masses, including wantonly murdering them, murdering them without provocation, without necessity, because exactly the more arbitrary the terror is, the more broadly it affects the masses. And that's one of the reasons why they like to engage in it and have as one of their main functions to engage in wanton and arbitrary terror against the masses of people. This is why we say we could do better. And this is why we say that people need to check out this leader, Bob Avakian, and check out and get with this revolution. And everybody needs to be in the streets on April 14th, saying no more to police killing people again and again and getting away with it. And look, do not tell me if you're white that this isn't your problem and you don't have to act around it. Because what I'll tell you is that we need a lot more white people like Cindy Sheehan doing what she did. <laughs> Adding her voice to the cry that this horror's got to stop. You can't turn away from these horrors. You can't say it's not my problem. It is your problem. These are our youth. These are our youth being beaten down in the streets, warehoused in prison, and shot down in the streets. I don't care if you're black, Latino, Asian, white, whatever. These are our youth, and we have to stop what's being done to them. Everybody needs to join the outpourings into the street on April 14th to say that police getting away with murder must stop. If you refuse to act to stop this, you're saying it's okay. And I ask you, is it okay for the police to gun down or choke people to death? No. Is it okay for politicians to excuse and justify these killings by talking about cops being heroes who have a tough job? No. Is it okay for the system's media to swallow and then spit out the lies that police cook up to try to cover their murderous deeds? No. Okay, if you mean that, then you gotta put yourselves on the line on April 14th. <laughs> and you have to go all out between now and April 14th to make it as powerful as possible. April 14th. No work, no school, shut down business as usual. Yeah. Stop police getting away with murder. Yeah. Thank you, sisters and brothers, and I'm going to call up Cornell. What a blessing to be here. As Brother Carl Dix 
still on fire, been at it for decades. Oh, I apologize for my voice. It's about to go out, but you let me know if I'm not communicating and I will try to be more clear and more loud. I just got off the plane from Chicago. We trying to push out a neo -oppor neoliberal opportunist named Rahm Emanuel. <laughs> trying to get rid of him. Brother Garcia. Not because he's pure, but because of the vicious attacks on poor people and working people. I want to thank each and every one of you for being here tonight. I come with a heavy heart. One of the great giants and geniuses of American culture just died, Reverend Dr. Gardner C. Taylor. He was a big brother of Martin Luther King Jr. He was a friend of Malcolm X. He was the founder of the Progressive Baptist Convention that said that the National Baptist Convention may be spiritually rich, but there's too much cowardice and conformity. He and Martin Luther King Jr. broke in the name of a love in the face of a vicious legacy of white supremacy in 1961. And he was pastor of Concord Baptist Church in Chocolate Slice of Brooklyn. I know I'm in Manhattan, but Brooklyn is the greatest borough in the world. Oh, I love me some Manhattan, but I know Brooklyn now. Oh, yeah. But let us never forget, Gardner Taylor, you may not subscribe to his progressive Christian practice, but you cannot deny his integrity, his honesty, his decency, and his courage. Give it up for Reverend Dr. Gardner C. Taylor. In the early, early 90s, he's gone now, but we shall never forget it. Never forget it. And the same is true with Mumia Abu Jamal. Let us keep him in our thoughts. If you're a revolutionary Christian like me, I'm praying for him constantly. I just talked to the brothers and sisters who were there at the Department of Corrections. He's lost 85 pounds already. Mumia Abu Jamal, unbowed, unbought, refused to sell out which is so characteristic these days. And people say, oh, but Brother West, didn't he kill a policeman? No, he didn't kill him. He didn't kill it. But he's still in jail. Same is true for Sundiata, so many others. Reason why Asada Shakur is in Cuba today. She didn't do it. But the police will come at you if you straighten up and, and try to tell the truth. And I, I begin with those figures because for me, I'm here. The reason why I spend the time with my dear brother Carl Dix, year after year after year, the reason why we went to jail over five years ago and had a, the trial for a week and came up guilty, but we had a smile on our face. Because we were bearing witness. The reason why we went to jail in Ferguson, same reason because there were two geniuses that raised the question over 41 years ago, one from St. Louis and the other from North Carolina. I'm talking about Donnie Hathaway and Roberta Flack. They raised the question, where is the love? Where is the love? And when you talk about Mumia Abu Jamal, Fannie Lou Hamer, Ida B. Wells, Sojourner Truth, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Hesher, Cesar Chavez, Dorothy Day, they are what the Isley brothers call a caravan of love. And we're here because when you look at the sparkling eyes of these precious ones, these priceless ones, we're here because we love them and we are unapologetic about our love of our young people, our precious people, our middle-aged people, our older people. And when you love folk, you hate the fact they've been treated unjustly. You loathe the fact they're being treated unfairly. And if you don't do something, the rocks are gonna cry out. That's why we here. 
That's where we gonna march on April 14th. Oh yeah, I don't care what color you are, how deep is your love for the young people. And I come from a people who for 400 years have been terrorized and traumatized and stigmatized, one of the most hated people of all of modern history. And who did we dish out? John Coltrane's Love Supreme. <laughs> Marvin Gaye's What's Going On. Stevie Wonder, Love and the Need of Love. Talk to the world something about love, and because justice is what love looks like in public, we taught the world something about justice too. In the face of 400 years of being trashed like cockroaches, shot down like dogs, but still straighten up our backs. Brother Arturo O'Farrell, will tell you, he's a great jazz musician. Give it up for Brother Arturo. He understands that great tradition. The Louis Armstrongs and Charlie Parkers and Mary Lou Williams and Sherry Allen that embrace everybody, white, brown, red, yellow, but it begins on the chocolate side of town because it's there where we refuse to be in denial about the legacy of white supremacy in America. It's profoundly human, it's universal, but it has a particularity. I know Brother Calvin, but where's Brother Calvin at? Is, is he already gone? Yeah. Well, tell that brother I love him. I'm going to keep track of him, too. <laughs> because he's head of the United Clergy, which is a five-borough organization of black preachers that's called for the resignation of the police commission. Yeah. Yeah. Call for the firing of the police and the medical helpers who stood there when our precious Eric Gardner was dying and hollering that he couldn't breathe. It's called for not the amending, but the ending of stop and frisk. Now why is that significant? That is significant because in this country, including in this city, we got too many mega churches that don't have mega love. Too many mega churches with not enough mega courage of all colors. And the reason being, of course, is that we live in the age of the sellout. Oh, yes. We've been told for 40 years to be successful in America is to have material toys and be well adjusted to injustice and well adapted to indifference rather than faithful to something bigger than you and put a smile on your grandmama's face from the grave because she taught you better than that. If she had the spiritual blackout that so many of our black professionals have these days, we wouldn't be here. I know I am who I am because somebody loved me just like we love these young people. That's the tradition that we're talking about. You say, oh, but Brother West, how come you always so hard on the leaders and the black leaders? I say, no, 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 I'm hard on myself. I begin with myself, and then it extends outward. But somebody's got to raise the question. For over seven years, young black and brown women and men have been shot down by the police every 28 hours. We got a black president, black attorney general, Black Cabinet Secretary of Homeland Security. Their fundamental aim is to ensure that citizens are secure and safe in America, but we haven't had one federal prosecution of a policeman for killing all of those folk. Something's wrong. Something deeply wrong. I call it a 
a key sweat moment. Something, something just ain't right. Something, something just ain't right. Because you get these black faces in high places that don't want to be committed to unarmed truth and the condition of truth is always to allow suffering to speak. And it's not a game. The struggle for justice is not a fad, it's not a fashion. It's a way of life and you have to be faithful unto death. Don't play with it. It ain't something to play with. Because these folk in power are serious. These folk in power use anything they can to buy you off, to cast water on your fire, to dangle seductions and temptations so you're no longer faithful to what your original calling is. And the calling is not grandiose. It's just wrestling with the four questions of the greatest public intellectual in the history of America, W.B. Du Bois. The boy said his four questions. How shall integrity face oppression? He didn't say cupidity, he didn't say venality, he didn't say vapidity. He said integrity face oppression. That second question, what does honesty do in the face of deception? All the lies and all the crimes, all the mendacity and criminality at work in America. It could be drones dropping bombs on innocent people. It could be 500 precious Palestinian babies killed in 50 days and not a mumbling word said by one politician. Not a mumbling word. And I would say exactly the same thing if there was a Palestinian occupation of my Jewish brothers and sisters because a Palestinian baby has exactly the same value as an Israeli baby, as a white baby, a brown baby, a yellow baby, a black baby. That's the kind of tradition I come out of. And I'm not ashamed of it. That's how I was raised. That third question, how, what does decency do in the face of insult? Attack, assault, dishonored, disrespected. Four and a half hours on the street, blood flowing, dog sniffing, and what really broke the back of many young folk was the dog urinating on the body. I mean, the level of contempt and disrespect. To be black in America, they're already disrespected anyway in various ways, but when it becomes that raw in that course, you got to do something. That's in part what Ferguson was about. And that's why many of our white brothers, brown brothers, yellow brothers said, this is too much. They've been shooting young folk for so long, older folk too. But when it reaches that point of such unadulterated disrespect, if you don't straighten your back up and go somewhere, something is wrong. And that last question, what does virtue do in the face of brute force? April 14th is simply a call for us to have integrity, honesty, decency, a sense of virtue, and not be afraid. And not be afraid. But to put it in another way, especially for black folk, we got to become de-niggerized. Because when you niggerize the people, you convince them that their lives have little or no value. When you niggerize the people, you try to convince them they're less beautiful, they're less moral, they're less intelligent. When you niggerize the people, you keep them so scared and afraid 
and intimidated that you're walking around laughing when it ain't funny and scratching when it don't itch. Wearing the mask, trying to make it through. Straighten your backs up. And we say that to our leadership. Look at all the different marches they had for Trayvon Martin. We said it then. It's not just a matter of fighting the laws in Florida. It's a matter of putting pressure on the White House, the Department of Justice, and the Congress as well as the state and the local. I don't care what color your president is, he has a responsibility to make sure his police are not engaging in trigger-happy policing. Or we put it another way, we put it another way. You and I know that if all those precious young folk look like the vanilla youth of Newtown, Connecticut for the last seven years, every 28 hours they're getting shot down like a dog, do you think there would be no federal prosecutions of a police in America? Hell no. That's the truth we need to tell. We stand with our brown Latino brothers and sisters. We stand with our poor white brothers and sisters. We stand with our Asian and our black brothers and sisters. It's a matter of morality. And for me as a Christian, it's a matter of spirituality. What kind of human being do I want to be? How do I want to live my life in terms of whatever sense of character that I have? Not because I'm perfect, but because I refuse to be a gangster. And I refuse to be afraid. Brother Martin used to say, I'd rather be dead than afraid. I agree with that. And that's what our young people more and more are feeling. That's why we cannot allow the spirit of resistance to fade away. That's what the corporate press is talking about. Oh, Ferguson is over. We gone to something else now so they can make some more money on their truncated reportage and on their centralizing media. That's all they want. No, no, no. We here for the long run. Because our love ain't no plaything. And we're going to tell the truth about the system as a whole. Neoliberal agenda. When we talk about neoliberal agenda, we mean financialize, privatize, militarize. That's what rules the country. Big banks, big corporations, big money, 1% of the population own 43% of the wealth, yet 40% of the precious children of color in America live in poverty. That's morally obscene. That's morally obscene. 22% of all of America's children, no matter what color, each one precious, living in poverty in the richest nation in the history of the world with prophets coming out like I don't know what, but hemorrhage at the top with the 1%. Thank God for the Occupy movement to at least tell us the truth about that. Tell us the truth about that. But it's not just financialized, but privatized. Privatize the schools. That's what we are fighting in Chicago. Shut down 50 schools, most of them in chocolate Chicago. Children dangling, teachers fired, and then shifted to the private schools. You got a problem in America? Bring in the big banks, bring in the GEOs, and privatize so they can make profits and somehow act as if they're dealing with the problem rather than just making more money. And as always, the militarize. We've invested over half a trillion dollars, a Marshall Plan, in what Michelle Alexander calls the new Jim Crow, the prison industrial complex. But when it comes to jobs with a living wage, when it comes to quality education, when it comes to decent housing, can't find a penny, can't find a penny. We got a budgetary deficit. But when it comes to war, when it comes to prison, the money flows, it flows. No, that's hypocrisy. That's mendacity. We gonna tell the truth out of the love that we have. That's why we come together. A lot of people ask me, why could a revolutionary Christian like you work with a revolutionary communist like Carl Dix? And I like to just throw that question out. 
Because Brother Arturo, Arturo, I aspire to be a jazz man in the world of ideas. And the blues man in the world and the life of the mind. And a jazz woman or a jazz man is always flexible and fluid and protein and moving back and forth and here and there. Sometime on the beat, sometime off the beat. Don't know what they're going to play, depending on what I'm feeling like. But there's always an integrity in that. And oh, if I can just be true to the voice of a Billy Holiday. The honesty, the decency, the vulnerability, the truth telling, the risk taking, the unbelievable courage to put her soul in her song in such a way that it affects your soul too. She's not just an entertainer, she's a warrior, she's a truth warrior, she's a love warrior. That sets the standard, y'all. So when I work with Brother Carl Dix, I say, oh, I keep track of the love that he has for poor people. I keep track of his willingness to sacrifice. I keep track of our analysis of the capitalist system, the analysis of American imperialism and the empire, and where it overlaps. And where it doesn't overlap, we argue. <laughs> I think he's wrong on the God question. He knows that. <laughs> we struggle over what we mean by socialism. I'm a democratic socialist. He's a communist. We got differences. <laughs> but you know what? Just like in Duke Ellington's orchestra, you allow all the different voices to come forward. You're not concerned about unanimity. You're not concerned about agreeing on every issue. When it comes to the children, we are faithful unto death. We are willing to fight and go to jail. When it comes to defending the working class, we are faithful unto death. We are willing to fight and go to jail. And anybody mess with Carl, I'm going to have to cut for Oh yeah, and of course he's not the only one. I got a whole lot of comrades that come. I got some Buddhists like bell hooks. I got some Jewish brothers and sisters like Susanna Hesch, Michael Lerner. I got white Christians like Field Barrican and Dorothy Day. And I got a lot of agnostic and atheists like Stanley Aronowitz and a host of others. We all come together fighting for justice. That's what April 14th is about. Brother Jim Vettos, you know what I'm talking about, brother. So thank you all so very much. I'm going to see you Union Square, April 14th. We going to be there. We going to be there. Let New York know we are loving our young folk, our middle-aged folk, all of those folk wrestling with this repressive apparatus.